Good morning. Is this mic on? Yes, it is. Awesome. Um, so this symposium that we're here at today is called The Future of Big Data. And I can tell you what the immediate, very soon future of big data is going to be. We've heard some inspiring talks this morning. We're going to see um, more hands-on stuff in the afternoon, and we'll do it again tomorrow. And we'll go home, and it'll be Friday, and we'll have the whole weekend ahead of us, and we'll be excited about data. And we'll start asking questions and thinking about the interesting and challenging problems that we could answer with data. Like, I mean, it's, it's up to you, really. But maybe I want to know, do, do Android users or iPhone users take better cat pictures? And so you'll go home. We've got the weekend ahead of us. And we'll look for data, some statistics about smartphone usage, look at some cat photos. And we'll, and we'll download them. And we'll see, like, well, there's actually not any like, hard kind of structured statistics about cat photos. So we'll have to find some sort of proxy to quantify the quality of a picture and, and put it in a, data, in a database and, and all this work. And pretty soon, it's Sunday night. We have to go back to work or to school the next morning. And we've not done a single really interesting thing, like visualized you know, data besides cat photos themselves. Um, we've not built a model. We've not really answered a question. Does this sound familiar to anyone? So I want to talk a bit today about some of these challenges with our cat photos and remind you that you're not alone. Um, and one thing that's very inherent in big data is complexity. And too often, it, it kind of gets swept under the rug. So I'll talk about that, and then talk about how at the Climate Corporation, um, we are using big data and data science to bring about the next revolution in agriculture. So Jennifer said, I, um, I do work at, um, at the Climate Corporation. I'll tell you a lot more about that later, um, and where I'm doing machine learning on remote sensing to you know, satellite imagery to build models and describe what's going on on the ground. And since they're satellites, we can do this at a global scale. Before that, I spent a number of years um, building kind of back-end distributed databases that will scale up to huge quantities of data. So I've kind of seen both sides of it. I'm still deep in the weeds doing you know, research day to day. So um, I want to, I, I, I think a lot of you are doing research as well. And so I really want to focus on some of these tangible questions, starting with the, the big data challenges. So what's the hardest part of scientific research? I've, research. I've kind of primed you for this answer. <laughs> I, think I, I think I heard data. Yeah. Throughout my entire career, many, many people have come to me and said, you know, I only can spend 20% of my, my day job, 20% of my life, answering the questions that I went to school to answer. Doing things in the domain, analyzing, building models, because the other 80% of my time is just massaging data, right? The technical term is munging, getting it into some format that's amenable to asking these questions. And it's because of tedious stuff like this, data discovery, ingesting data, getting into some database, transferring it from servers to other servers if necessary, um, visualizing it, cleaning data. Data is never clean. A lot of algorithms um, need kind of human-labeled, almost truth training data. And that is an expensive uh, process. And then at the end, you want to share your work. You want to share your results. And I don't just mean in a published white paper. You, you actually want to share the data sets and your results with others. And I'll tell you right now, there's not a solution to any of this. But there are many solutions that can get you started. Uh, I used to think early on in research here that I was alone because I'd, I'd tried to do my research and I'd hit one of these problems. And I'd be like, oh, well, this is an interesting problem. It was at the time. Um, and I would start going down a rabbit hole to solve this problem. And then I'd do it. And I'd come back up. And I'd see another one. And I, and I was never really answering the interesting research questions. And then after more and more research projects, I started noticing a pattern like, hey, I've seen this before. It made me think that maybe others had seen it before. Yes, you've all seen it before. And that in and of itself is a very important thing to recognize. Recognize when you're going down one of these rabbit holes that, hey, I can ask my colleague. I can ask my friends. A lot of times they're in the same domain. They're dealing with the same types of data. They may have cut, you know, built something or have some advice. They may have recommendations on what data set you, you could use. Um, if your colleagues fail you, take one of these terms and throw it into Google. 
the key to Googling is knowing what to search for, right? These are the words. Um, but the, the critical thing to know is that you're not alone. I, I, like I said, I can't solve the problems for you, but uh, it's, it's really important to recognize when you're doing what you need to be doing and what can be made more efficient to get there. So that's all I have to say about that. Um, and once we've gotten a bunch of data, there's a lot of complexity that, that we've got to address. And I want us to start thinking about um, complex data as being big. There, and really appreciate that. So how does data get big? Well, if we read the news, we read about Google and Amazon and Facebook, and they put up some web app, and they miraculously get millions of users coming to it who are doing billions of events on this app. And these events might be buying a product. They might be issuing search queries. They might be friending another user. And these events get up you know, on the back end servers, they get appended to this log or thrown into a database table, but they're all kind of homogenous in nature, right? If a friend request looks like any other friend request, they've got the initiator, they've got the recipient of the request, they've got how do you know this person, maybe some maybe metadata about your browser or what have you, but they're all structured and pretty uniform. And once you have a million users, of course, it's very easy to just get billions of these and you can go from gigabytes to petabytes to terabytes not in that order. Um, and so, so that's great. And then you can do analysis. And you've skipped some of the process of, of cleaning, right? The majority of people here, however, don't have the problem of millions of users, myself included. We have to get many small data sets from myriad sources. I might get data from the national government. I might get data from an ag extension office. I might get data from a county. And they all um, tell a little bit, a part of the story that I'm trying to answer. But I've got to put them together. And this is a hard, hard task because they might have different, cover different time spans. They might um, be ambiguous as to really how do you join them together. So um, this is really the, the question about big data. Where am I? There we go. So just to show you a concrete example. If I want corn yield data for the United States, I can get a time series of one data point per year. What is the, the national corn yield in that uh, corn yield of the United States in this year? This is on the left. Or I can get, uh, find the data at a county level, which gives me a whole new dimension on which I can slice the data. Or I can even um, use equi um, equipment on a farmer's harvester or combine. I can use aerial imagery, and I can even get sub-field level yield data, you know, every square meter or what have you. And so it's all the same data, right? But they're very different scales. They're very different spatial coverage. Weather data is another interesting example. Back in the 1870s, we as a nation decided, hey, we'll, we'll start this network of gauges, which are you know, rain gauges and thermometers and barometers. And these are you know, points on the Earth. And they would follow where people were settling. And over decades and years, uh, new gauges would come online. Old gauges would come offline. You have very kind of incomplete, an incomplete view, both in time and in space, of the state of the atmosphere. But it's something. And then around the 1950s, we started um, using physical models in a process called reanalysis to take these past observations as input to a computational model and fill the spatial and temporal gaps of those observations, which is useful to show trends. It's on a very coarse grid for computational power at the time. And they could also be used to initialize, the output of these reanalysis models could be used to initialize um, higher resolution physical models for future forecasts. And then in 2006, the radar network was integrated in the United States, Doppler radar. And we can use Doppler radar and satellite and these gauges and numerical weather prediction models and integrate them all, multiple sensors, into a single derived data set, which is of pretty full coverage over the continental United States, um, high resolution. It's simulated in some way, but it's, it's a lot cleaner. And the key here to what was done with that multi-sensor data network is data integration, which I define as combining heterogeneous sources of data into 
a unified view. It sounds simple, it sounds straightforward, it's not ever, but this is critical because big data is useless if you don't have a way to ask questions of it. Many people ask me in my current job, in my last job, wherever I go, how much data does your company have? I don't care. The only people who care how many pet petabytes or bytes or whatever you have are the people building the backend data storage systems themselves that have to scale to that many bytes. To anyone else who, who's, who's really doing research, they're, they want to be able to ask the question, you know, what temporal coverage do I have for yield data in the top three corn counties of Nebraska? That's a rich question, and that's powerful. And it's a big data integration problem. Um, if you're familiar with relation, relational databases, they're pretty good at facilitating data integration. If you're not, it's only one slide. Um, <clears throat> So, and, and the reason that they facilitate data integration is because they force you on loading the data, on ingesting the data, to normalize your data into a, um, into a format that makes it amenable for easy joins and easy queries. And this query language is called the structured query language SQL, SQL. And so SQL is a data integration tool. And so in this example, I have a table of um, harvests, their yields by, a, by field, by year. And I've got another table of counties telling me which state each county's in. And I can, with just this, I can write really rich queries and say, hey, what is the total per county yield per year of corn? Using, this is uh, SQL in the, in the bottom. So it's very powerful. This is data integration. You can ask rich questions. It's not a great solution for every type of data, but it hits a lot. Um, things that it doesn't do as well are like time series or if you have um, geospatial data with shapes on the earth, it, it doesn't quite fit into such a tabular format. Um, within the Climate Corporation, we have an internal core data service for weather. So this plot, this picture shows for a single location on the earth, the maximum daily temperature. It's a time series. And there's a vertical dotted uh, orange line that shows today. And if you notice in the past, we have an empirically observed maximum daily temperature. No questions about it, it's a time series. And this comes from one data source. This comes from the gauges that I talked about. But if we go into the future, we can't empirically measure this. We can only model it, we can predict it. And so for the upcoming seven to 14 days, we can use short-term numerical weather forecasts from another source. And then, uh, and you can see the kind of distribution of the certainty of these predictions starts to explode. And then after about 14 days, the numerical weather predictions fall apart and we have to fall back to climatological trends and averages, which have enormous uncertainty, but they still tell us something. It tells us that in the middle of December, it won't be a 70 degrees. But these climatological trends are another, uh, a third data source. And so, you know, yes, once upon a time, someone at our company had to go about find, identifying these sources and, and integrating them. But once that's done, it's incredibly powerful to researchers, for people who want to make applications, because all they have to care about is say, where am I? Or what, what point on earth do I, do I want the weather for? And what's the time span? They don't even have to know if it's in the past or the future. They need to know that they're going to get back a time series of temperature. And that's super simple. They don't need to know where that data comes from. If they really need to know where the data comes from, that's OK, because our, our weather data integration service um, annotates all the values fully described with metadata of, you know, what are units, where did it come from, how is it measured. But often we don't really care, right? So you can do the same thing. This is weather. You can do the same thing for soil data, which come from national surveys, from in-ground measurements, you name it, from satellite models, in fact. Uh, you can do this for farm fields. Tell me everything you can about a farm field. You know, who owns it? What's the elevation? What was the yield history for the last decade? You can do this for satellite image sources. In satellite image sources, there's actually a great tool that already exists and you can use by google.org in collaboration with the University of Maryland, NASA, and the USGS. And they've taken 40 years going back from a handful of satellites orbiting the Earth, and they continue to do so you know, today and, and in the future. These, and they've stored these, these data sets, which are enormous, on Google servers that, that Tim was talking about this morning. 
Um, this, this graph is the state of Nebraska. You can see this is actually vegetative uh, and vegetative index, vegetative health over the state of Nebraska. You can see Lake McConaughey and uh, was it Lewis and Clark Lake? If you look carefully, the Platte River. And these, these lines are actually paths that Landsat 8 satellite took over the, the state. And it doesn't do the whole state in one day. It takes 16 days to cover the Earth. And so these paths are actually from different points in time. But uh, this is the, the product is called Google Earth Engine. Google Earth Engine is able to composite these together. And they have a pretty, pretty straightforward, easy querying language, programming language even, that you can write your programs in to operate on this satellite imagery. You write it in your web browser, you hit run, it sends your code off to Google servers, where, which run your code right next to the satellite data itself and send you back the result and display the output of your program in your web browser. Super handy for doing research and a great example of data integration. So integration is one part of the complexity. There's more. Um, the allure of big data is really to be able um, to spot more trends. And this is challenging if you have different types of complexity in your data. So uh, I asked the hardest part of doing research is finding data. The second hardest is map projections. If you've ever dealt with geospatial data, right? Understanding exactly how this relates to the surface of the Earth, they're hard. And there are whole areas of statistics dedicated to algorithms for spatial analysis. There's whole areas of statistics de devoted to time series analysis. So spatial temporal data is, is complex. Um, data sparsity and missing data are more challenges that you're gonna encounter, you're gonna have to address. Um, any algorithm that I can think of off the bat assumes you never have missing values. You always have missing values, right? You've got to do something about this. Uh, if you're doing environmental measurements, sensors, these things have inherent error in the way they measure. Um, there's the curse of dimensionality, whereas you get more and more data, if you get high, high levels of dimensions, um, the points get farther apart in the high dimensional space, and so certain algorithms kind of break down. And then if you're looking for trends in data, you have to always remember and be careful of the uncertainty. So just as, as when you throw more monkeys with typewriters into a room together, the sooner that they're gonna write Shakespeare, the same thing happens with big quantities of data. If I get more and more columns in my table and more rows, and I can start slicing and dicing them and juxtaposing the, the different variables in so many ways. Pretty soon I'm gonna find an almost perfect correlation that is spurious. And so we all learn in Statistics 101, you build a model, you, you partition your data, you build a model on a training data set, and then you evaluate its performance by applying it to a held out test set. We all know this, we all learn this, but I still every once in a while come across a peer reviewed paper where they don't do this. And it's really important, especially with large data sets, to have a solid statistical grounding. Because in agriculture, we can't just A-B test or multi-arm bandit test the, our recommendations like you might do with certain things at, at Google. We can't say farmer A, farm your field this way this year, farmer B, do this other thing. We'll let the season run its course and at the end of the year we'll see who got the biggest harvest and we'll make that recommendation to everyone next year. You, you can't do it. And so it's absolutely critical to understand before we show any recommendations or insights to growers to understand the air bars, understand the, the spatial and temporal variability in our recommendations. And this leads me into kind of the process by which we apply data science at the Climate Corporation. Data science is really the nexus of these three fields, this DS in the middle. It's the nexus of domain science, statistical, uh, statistics, and software engineering, which asks how can it be built. And the statistics, we're asking a modeling question, a predictive question of what does this data tell me about the future? And we use domain science to inform what those questions are. And through this, we can turn data into insights. And so the, domain, the domains include biology, agronomy, hydrology, atmospheric science. And in fact, we have structured our entire science organization around these domains. And so we've got um, agronomic modelers, geospatial and remote sensing modelers, climatology, atmospheric science modeling. We also have data teams because we're always looking for more data, uh, field trials, field measurements, uh, grower feedback and, and performance studies so that we can integrate these 
into the predictive models we're building. And each of these modeling teams are multidisciplinary with the three disciplines I just showed. And so the critical skills that we're looking for really are um, people who have great statistical and analytical skills, who can evaluate deterministic or predictive models. We're looking for people with uh, a deep understanding of the physical processes, the domain. And this includes models that are not statistical whatsoever in nature. So we, there are evapotranspiration models, there are physical um, weather models, physical models of, of hydrology and groundwater. Um, scientific programming is important, an important skill for anyone to have. And this can go one of two ways. You might be great at high-performance computing. You might be great at just scripting and iterate, iterating new ideas very quickly in Python or R. Very rarely are people super experts at both, but you know, one or the other is good. And it goes without saying, we all need great communication. But at the end of our research in the science organization, we are, yeah, we are writing a final peer-reviewed paper, but there's far more than that. We are communicating the results with designers to make sure that you know, the color map is, is logical. We're working with our product teams to make sure that they, the entire company, understands the certainty and uncertainty of our recommendations before we show it to growers. And so, um, with, so within each of the modeling teams, we have people with all these levels of expertise. Now I can give kind of my, I guess, advice, my insight into um, what I think to be a pretty good way of doing research, which we follow at the Climate Corporation. Um, start small. Focus on an area that has the richest or the most data. You might, if you're, if you're predicting yield, you might start with Platte County, Nebraska before you tackle the entire world. Uh, the field of computer vision has done, uh, has some really cool stories about this. So, by no means is computer vision a solved problem. I can't take my smartphone out to a soybean field, photograph a weed, and say, hey, computer vision, please identify this weed for me. You can't do that. But there are things, very specific tasks, that are totally solved. So I can write an address on an envelope, send it in the, pay the mail. The US Postal Service will um, have computer vision, automatically read my address, the zip code, sort it automatically without a human ever touching it. Face recognition, as long as you have a specific task, like, a, like the, the full-on view of someone's face, you know, your Facebook or Google Plus can, can suggest, hey, I think I know who that person is. Um, I think a good rule of thumb for starting small is focus about two-thirds on where you can go today, right now, and one-third on thinking about where you can go in the future. We iterate. We try, to, we try a lot of ideas early on, try to fail fast. We want to prove early on the feasibility of an idea and prove the value of it before we spend too much time into it. Uh, we, every team meets every single day for 15 minutes, and we talk, each, and each member talks about what we did yesterday, what went great, what's not working, and this is a good opportunity for your peers to, in very real time, you know, recommend, did you try this? How can we get unblocked? Or even just brainstorm brand new approaches. We also peer review not only our final research papers, but every single line of research code that we write gets reviewed by a colleague. This helps us identify bugs early on, and we also check in this code to a version control system because agriculture is very cyclical. And so I guarantee you that if I write a model to detect pests in the field for 2014, we will revisit that code in 2015. We might have more data, we just want to run it again. Or we might have a brand new model we want to compare which one's better. Not only the code, we even uh, save every single bit of intermediate research data so that it, it's, it's painless to go back to code that was written nine months ago, a year and a half ago, and just rerun it. PDFs are not easily reproducible. There's a wealth of knowledge in what we produce, and it's great research, but it's, it's critical to be able to reproduce this easily. So, at the Climate Corporation, our story follows this, this trajectory. We started small as a company. We got weather data. It was relatively easy to acquire and well-structured. And we offered parametric weather insurance to farmers. So this is like if, if there was a lot of rain when you were supposed to be planting and you couldn't get the seed in the ground on time, or there was an early freeze at harvest, before harvest, or there were three consecutive 97 degree days in the month of July. Things like this, we'd, we'd come up with rules that we knew would damage your crop. And when the weather hit that threshold, we cut you a check. No adjusters. 
it was a good start, but we quickly realized that farmers are impacted by far more than just the weather. They've got the soil in their fields, the hybrid they choose, um, pests, you know. So we had to iterate this, this business model. And we developed an organization of the modeling teams, agronomic modeling, remote sensing, climatology, to deliver more. And these teams are made up of researchers, machine learners, statisticians, um, physical scientists, computer scientists, all who want to make a difference in the world. And they are creating the next revolution in agriculture, which is data science. Agriculture is, as you know, the backbone of Nebraska. And every growing season, a farmer makes about 40 decisions to drive one result. These decisions start in the winter, in the season before planting, analyzing what was, how'd things go last year, what worked well, what didn't, choosing what crop will I plant next year, what seed hybrid of that crop will I plant next year. Um, and then in the months leading up to planting, um, he's making decisions, making sure the soil is in line, making sure irrigation concerns are going to be ready. And then comes planting. And of course, there's logistical questions. What order do I plant the fields in? Do I send three planters to a field at a time, or do I distribute them? And there's also quite even questions within a field, like how closely together do I put the seed? Farmers can have, uh, you're going to hear about this in the next talk, farmers have really precise equipment that can even you know, plant seed differently depending on where in the field they are. And so these are all decisions that have to be made. And then there's the growing season. A farmer's always out scouting, looking for pests, making sure the fields are irrigated, deciding do I have to apply um, uh, herbicide or fertilizer, how much. And then around harvest, there's um, more, yet more decisions. So am I going to sell futures, or will I wait for the market price? How long can I let the grain sit in the field and dry down so I don't have to pay um, drying costs at the silo before I harvest it, or before rain comes and ruins my, and ruins my effort? Um, and then there's more logistics and, and timing questions around that. So all these decisions in one season and one chance to get it right. From the 1940s to the 1960s, we saw in agriculture the green revolution where we started uh, in really in earnest breeding hybrids. We saw a lot of new irrigation infrastructure, synthetic fertilizers, and that was followed by biotech where you can do things like the biotech revolution where you can do things like take, use marker assisted selection. You, you extract some DNA from plant tissue. Um, you can separate the genes in a way to identify the presence or the absence of traits and you can breed more quickly and in a more informed way with less waste. And now with 40 decisions, 40 in, inputs and one outcome, it's still very hard to identify the strongest determinants of yield or profit. And so we're really on the cusp, the cusp of this uh, green data revolution where we can use data science to optimize these decisions and all of these revolutions are still going on in one way or another and they all have the same goal which is more production and fewer resources so we at the climate corporation are taking data off the farm and integrating it and visualizing it so that the farmer can very quickly make decisions the, the decisions that he has to make and these the, the cool thing is that these decisions are no longer based on qualitative discussion or talking over coffee or thinking back to what did I do 10 years ago? What did my father do? What did my grandfather do? And this is a major transformation from this to this. So how do we do this? We take all the data sets we can get, all of them. We take what hybrid is, this, is the farmer planting? Where is his field? What's the elevation? What's the slope like? How does water run off of it? What's the weather been? What's it going to be? What was the planting date? What was the soil measurements, um, nitrogen in the soil on planting? What crop did he grow last year? And we build a model. This is an example of a yield model. It's just an example, but, we, but essentially it's formalizing yield as a function of genetics, farming practice, and the environment. This model is asking the question, what is the relationship between the seed, what the farmer did do, and what was done to him. And we use it to inform our decisions about the things that the, farmers, the farmer can control, G and P, to drive the yield Y up. And of course, in any model, as you know, there's uncertainty. This is the variability term. And we 
always want to fit a model that kind of minimizes this uncertainty. And the more data we can get, the more the variability goes down. And so we're always looking for higher resolution, higher frequency, higher volume data. And with it comes complexity. But what we can do with this yield model is take what has in the past been this, this blue distribution of yields that have been optimized using traditional practice for your environment um, to recommend you know, genetics and farming practices. And we want to shift that entire distribution to the right towards higher yields so that by using a predictive model in data science, we can make recommendations for your environment of genetics and, plant and um, planting practices. Yield is maybe the most obvious example. It's not the only one. Because at the end of the year, the farmer doesn't care quite as much about yield as he does about profit. And nitrogen is a huge line item in a farmer's budget every year. And so if he can get the, even just the same yield with less nitrogen application, that is a win for the farmer's budget, and that is a win for the environment. And so this slide shows an uh, advisor tool that we use that, that com is comparing different nitrogen application scenarios. Because existing research on nitrogen application in farms has been an aggregate. And, but the reality is that a, a farmer's individual field, the nitrogen levels in that field are so dependent on the conditions in the field, the soil, the weather, the tilling practices, that um, these things drive significant changes to the physical processes of nitrogen, like volatilization or leaching. And so by integrating data about your practices and your environment, we can make quantitative recommendations. And we, although we do this at an individual field level, the problems that we're solving go far beyond individual growers. Uh, many of you have probably at least heard about um, hypoxia in the northern Gulf of Mexico, and this is strongly believed to be um, driven in large part by excess nitrogen in the, in the Mississippi drainage basin. But knowing that there are there's so much variability in, nit in a field's nitrogen needs from year to year. If we understand those factors and use uh, nitrogen more efficiently on a field level, we're also using nitrogen more efficiently on large geographies and can hopefully help you know, decrease this, this problem in the Gulf of Mexico. So we at the climate, one of our products at Climate is um, Climate Pro that has the high impact decisions like nitrogen and yield um, it has all these features on the right, um, but, all of, but all of you ha have, they're somewhere on these tables, pass them around, these little cards for Climate Basic. And this is where what used to be the norm, Farmer's Almanac, essentially, um, you can still get, you can sign up for free. I know that, um, I'm not giving these to you because you're our target audience, you're probably not, but it's still cool. You can log in, just pick fields, whatever, you know, wherever, where, near where you grew up, whatever, and you can see some of the the data services that we can provide, some of the data integration that we've done. And the, even the free service does have an element of predictive modeling. So the first one on this list is, is field workability. You know, can I drive a tractor over the ground without it getting stuck, or, or is it moist enough to actually plant seed? Because let's say at harvest time, you know, time is really of the essence to, to harvest the field, and the fuel for your combine is costly. And so we need to take all sorts of data sets about the field, the soil, the weather, and distill them into a single yes or no decision that the farmer needs to decide, should I go work a field that's 30 miles away? So that's some of the stuff we're doing. I, I, I don't mean to discourage you with these data challenges and the complexity. They're hard problems, but you are not alone. So you should totally go home this weekend and analyze cat pictures. But, but be able to know when you're going down the rabbit hole and step out and ask your friends. Um, others have come before you in the big data realm, um, Google and Twitter on the, the petabyte side, and then you know, Climate Corporation and your colleagues here at, at UNL um, on the data complexity side. And so um, you know, just remember big data is not just about the gigabytes. We all have big data problems, and we at the Climate Corporation are tackling that compl complexity and bringing it to agriculture. So thank you for your time. I'm happy to tell you anything I can about what we do.